Thank you, Minister. That concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Later today, this Parliament will be asked to vote for an increase in council tax. We on these benches accept the need to end the freeze and to increase rates for those in the very largest homes. But we believe that the SNP's plans go too far by hitting thousands of ordinary working households. Today, trade bodies are warning that we should be wary of putting up taxes too much, adding to the pressure on families who are already struggling with higher inflation while consumer confidence is fragile. Can I ask the First Minister why those trade bodies are wrong? First Minister. Well, everything we have put forward in terms of tax proposals have uh, sought to be responsible, balanced and progressive. And I would, uh, at this stage, remind Ruth Davidson that we put our proposals on council tax to the Scottish people in the election in May this year. Uh, and we won that election. In fact, uh, the SNP scored more votes in that election than the Conservatives and the Labour Party combined. So there is a significant mandate to take forward the proposals that we put forward. Uh, they are reasonable, uh, they are balanced and they are progressive. Uh, they do increase council tax for those living in the highest banded uh, housing. They deliver protection for those on low incomes. Uh, and of course, for the vast majority of council tax payers, the rebanding will not increase bills uh, by a single payment. Penny. And crucially, and I think this is the crucial point, uh, the proposals that we are putting forward, which will be voted on at five o'clock tonight in this chamber, will raise £100 million to help us in our mission to raise attainment in schools. And parties across this chamber frequently, and may I say, rightly talk about the importance of raising attainment in schools. But you can't talk about the desirability of the ends of achieving that unless you're also prepared to vote for the means to do it. Ruth Davidson. There will be thousands of ordinary families living in situations that I've just described who will be hit by this and who will be taking very careful note of exactly what the First Minister has just said in the language that she's used. Because it's not just council tax that's on the way up for them. We know that the Scottish Government wants to levy income tax at a rate higher than the rest of the United Kingdom. And they've already pushed through business rates above levels in the rest of the UK too. The Deputy First Minister once said that this administration acknowledges that business rates do play a part in attracting and retaining businesses and is therefore committed to setting the poundage rate no higher than is set in England. He was right when he said it then. Why is he not right now? First Minister. Well, look, sticking just for a second with council tax, three out of four Scottish households will pay no more in council tax as a result of the rebanding that the Parliament will vote on uh, this evening. Yes, people living in higher banded houses uh, will pay more. And of course, we also propose lifting the freeze, uh, but capping that at 3%. But local authorities will have the ability uh, to decide uh, within that parameter to raise council tax if they so wish. I think that's right. It's responsible. It's progressive. And crucially, it gained the support of the Scottish people in an election just a matter of months ago. Uh, now, in terms of the wider issue around taxation, a matter of a few weeks, we will bring forward a budget for uh, the next financial year and all of these uh, matters will be covered in our budget and Parliament will have the opportunity, as it always does, to scrutinise and to vote in due course on our budget. Uh, I am confident in the proposals, the reasonable and balanced proposals we will bring forward. I know there are some in this Parliament and uh, they have every right to argue and will continue to argue who say we should go further. Um, I respect that and we'll have these uh, discussions as we go through the budget process. But I do think there is a real hypocrisy at the heart of the Tories' position because week in and week out in this chamber, Ruth Davidson stands up and calls for more investment in the health service, more investment in education, more investment in policing, more investment in practically every single responsibility uh, that the Scottish Government has. And yet she is not prepared to say where the money is coming from. She's against modest increases in the council tax. She's against uh, the position of this government in terms of not having a major income tax cut for the highest paid people in our country. Uh, she's against uh, modest proposals around business taxes. So she comes here and says where we should spend extra money, but she doesn't have the gumption to come here and say where that money should come from. And that is not an acceptable or reasonable position for somebody who calls themselves the opposition to take. Ruth Davidson. 
absolutely zero answer for the one in eight businesses in Scotland who are now paying higher taxes than they would do south of the border. Nothing for them. And the bottom line is this. We are moving to a new phase in this parliament. And it's a phase where it's going to be economic growth which determines how much money the Scottish Government has to spend. But if we tax too much, we're only going to deter the growth and the tax receipts that we need. And for the benefit of Derek Mackay, that is Laffer Economics. Um, but the trouble is this. There are people watching this parliament and they're seeing parties whose only question on tax is how high can we go? Why can't the First Minister see that this will only damage Scotland's reputation as a place to do business? First Minister. This is just flatly wrong. I mean, look at business rates in particular. We've got the most generous and the most competitive system for business rates, particularly when it comes to small businesses of, I think, any part in the UK. And we've put forward proposals to expand our small business bonus scheme so that more small business premises, 100,000 uh, once we do the expansion, small business premises across Scotland will pay no business rates whatsoever. That's how we get growth going in our economy support those small businesses across the country who employ people uh, and provide vital services in communities the length and breadth of Scotland. But I come back to the point I made earlier on. We know what Ruth Davidson is against uh, when it comes to taxation. She's against modest reform uh, of the council tax and modest increases for the highest banded housing uh, on council tax. Uh, she's against the Scottish Government's position when it says we don't think it's right to give a massive income tax cut to the highest paid in our society. Uh, but we don't know what she's for when it comes to raising the extra revenue to invest in the public services. She always says need extra revenue. In fact, the only thing uh, we know uh, about the Conservatives when it comes to revenue raising, the only people we, th we know that the Conservatives think should be paying more are the sick in our society because the Conservatives want to put back prescription charges. So they want to protect the highest paid in our society, but they want those sick and in need of prescriptions to pay the price. I think the Conservatives' position is shameful and that's why the Scottish Government will continue to put forward the reasonable and progressive positions that we do across the range of tax powers that we have. Ruth Davison. I've got the government's table on business poundage rates here and there's one in eight businesses that are paying in Scotland 51 pence in the pound. If they were down south, it would be 49. But she says she knows what I'm against. Well, I'll tell all of Scotland what I'm against. I'm against the biggest threat to Scotland's economy at the moment, which is the constitutional certainty that she's put on the table. Absolutely. And the thing is, the thing is, it's not just me. Last week, the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors said the real problem facing investment and jobs in Scotland is her threat of a second referendum. The latest Scottish Property Review says that a second referendum, and I quote, could have serious consequences for the market and will be, again I quote, a drag upon investment and development. So here is the SNP plan. Higher council tax, higher business rates, higher income tax and a second referendum which is damaging confidence. We all want economic growth, but how does that plan deliver it? First Minister. Mr Presiding Officer, when I start to wonder if Ruth Davidson is my secret FMQ's agent, that she can get up today of all days and talk about constitutional uncertainty, frankly, beggars belief. Uh, there's not a lot of competence in Ruth Davidson's preparation for First Minister's questions uh, based on that. This is the day when her party has just been overturned in the courts, uh, where the courts have said uh, their intention to trigger Article 50 without a vote in Parliament is illegal. For her to come and talk about constitutional uncertainty Absolutely. is, frankly, uh, <laughs> beyond words. Well, let me, let me make quite clear, presiding officer, the job of this government. The job of this government is to make sure we look after our public services, is to make sure we bring forward proposals for tax that are reasonable, balanced and progressive, allow us to protect those public services uh, and allow us to make sure that we are supporting our economy to grow, particularly through our support for the smallest businesses in our country. And our job also is to make sure that we are standing up for the interests of this country and doing everything we can to prevent the party that Ruth 
Davidson is a member of from dragging Scotland out of the European Union against our will, because that is the biggest risk to our economy, and that is what Ruth Davidson really needs to wake up to. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. You asked the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. President Officer, the council tax has to go. Not my words, but the words of John Swinney, eight years ago this very month. The hated council tax is totally unfair, and any tinkering with bans would not make the system any fairer. Not my words, but the words of Nicola Sturgeon in 2007. Later today, this Parliament will debate the future of council tax in Scotland. Why will the First Minister not keep the manifesto promise she made to voters to scrap the unfair council tax? First Minister. I'm proposing to keep the manifesto promise that I was elected First Minister on the strength of just a few months ago Absolutely. in May. And I would repeat the comment I made to Ruth Davidson, the proposals that Parliament will vote on today are the proposals that were in the SNP manifesto that were put to the Scottish people and which saw the return of this government with more votes than the Tories and Labour combined. So that's the authority and the mandate behind the proposal that we will put to Parliament this afternoon. And I say again, those proposals are fair, they are balanced, they are progressive and crucially they will raise £100 million of extra revenue to invest in our schools to help us raise attainment and close the attainment gap, something that I have repeatedly said is the top priority of this government. Now, as I said earlier on to Ruth Davidson, I, I respect the fact that there are voices in this Parliament, and you know, I think the Greens in particular have uh, credibility on this issue, more credibility perhaps than other parties have, that want us to go further. And as, as, as I have said, I am absolutely absolutely happy to continue the discussion about progressive reform of local tax but the vote tonight at five o'clock is not some kind of political game it's a vote with real implications absolutely. it's a vote to decide uh, whether or not we implement these responsible changes to council tax and deliver a hundred million pounds of extra revenue for our schools or that we do not now i can understand uh, why the tories will vote against these plans tonight because the Dorries don't believe in progressive taxation. They don't believe, as we've just heard, in raising extra revenue for public services. But what the public, I think, will struggle to understand is if the names of Labour MSPs at any point tonight appear in the same voting column as the Conservatives. That, presiding officer, will be inexplicable. Officer, the First Minister seems to have forgotten that she lost her majority in May. Wait, I know, I know, I know. Wait, wait a minute. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. In 2011, Here's the thing, presiding officer, in 2011, she won a majority in this chamber with a promise to scrap the council tax. Oh, and I think she only that? has a mandate when it suits her. Yeah. And the truth Jesus is, the like First Minister minutes. has broken her promise to voters. Yeah. When the measures are voted on later today, the SNP wants to just tinker with the bans, Nicola's own words. And she again admitted that that would not make the system any fairer. This isn't big enough, First Minister. It isn't bold enough. Under the SNP's plans, families living in homes worth the least will be as worse off as they are today. But under Labour's plans, families in Band A properties would pay less than they do today. New independent research shows that under the SNP's plans, someone in Band A will still pay four times more tax as a proportion of their home than the richest in Band H. So Labour would scrap the unfair council tax and introduce a fairer system so that 80% of households would pay less. Why won't she support that? First Minister. Well, I know. 
I know, I know Kezia Dugdale spent the last few days campaigning in an election uh, on the other side of, of, of the pond, and we'd be on the same side of, of that, incidentally. Uh, but let me remind her that her party lost its position as the official opposition in this chamber in the recent election. And the proposals that this party put forward in that election attracted more votes than the Conservative proposals and Labour proposals combined. That is the reality. That's why we will put forward our proposals tonight uh, for fair and progressive changes that will raise £100 million for our schools. And it's decision time for Labour because people will be looking tonight to see uh, whose column Labour MSP's name end up in. Will they end up in the column of fair and progressive change and more money for our schools? Or will they end up in the same column as the Conservatives? who don't believe in progressive taxation and who don't want to protect our public services. So it really is decision time for Labour. I look forward to seeing which way it falls. Regularly, President Officer, the First Minister comes to this chamber and crows about the extra £100 million she's going to spend on schools. But what she fails to tell the chamber is that last year she ripped out £500 million from our schools and local public services. And we have yet to hear from this year's budget how many hundreds of millions of pounds more you are going to strip from our local services. Now here's the thing, presiding officer, I believe in investing in education and I believe in the redistribution of wealth. But funding for local services should be redistributed locally and this national government should have the guts to use its own tax powers to close that gap between the richest and the poorest kids. The bottom line is this. The First Minister does not have to pass on Tory austerity. Yeah. She can make different choices to protect our local services. Isn't it the case that the only way to stop the cuts is to back Labour's tax plans? First Minister. The simple fact of the matter is, strip all of that away, because we could debate backwards and forwards, the truth or otherwise, of what Kezia has said. The fact is, at five o'clock tonight, there is a hundred million pounds for schools yeah. on the table. Yeah. It will be available for schools at the press of a button. We've heard from Ruth Davidson yeah. that the Tories will be voting against £100 million pounds for our schools. The question is, will Labour be lining up with the Conservatives tonight yeah. or will Labour be voting with the government yeah. for progressive changes to council tax that deliver £100 million pounds for our yeah. schools? People will be watching uh, and we'll wait and see what Labour decides yeah. to do. We have a couple of constituency questions. First, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister may be aware of the tragic situation of Sean McKenna in my constituency, whose body was found last week after having been missing for almost three weeks. I would pay tribute to the, Sean's family for their bravery during this incredibly difficult time, and also to the Coatbridge Police and many hundreds of local people who dedicated their time to helping in the search for Sean. Can the First Minister outline what support is available to families of missing persons and what procedures are in place for the police to coordinate large-scale civilian searches. First Minister. Well, I am, of course, aware of the tragic case of Sean McKenna, and I want to take this opportunity to offer my sincere condolences to his family and friends. Uh, police Scotland do have standard operating procedures for coordination and participation of civilian searches. Uh, in such distressing circumstances, it is, of course, heartening to see the very many volunteers from local communities who are willing to give up their own time to offer their assistance in searching for a, a missing person. Uh, it's important that Police Scotland continue uh, to operate its own procedures, and uh, as they will always do in a range of different issues, keep those procedures under review. But I'm sure all of us want to thank the volunteers who assisted uh, in this and once again offer our condolences to the family uh, of Sean McKenna at this unimaginably difficult time for them. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Could I ask the, F the First Minister if she's aware that the unelected health board in Lanarkshire has removed orthopaedic and trauma from Monklands General Hospital on Monday of this week, ignoring the vote of this parliament and the local campaign against this cut? Does she find that acceptable? And can she explain why this is not being called in as a major service change by her government? First Minister. Uh, well, uh, 
I, I'm not sure, genuinely not sure whether Elaine Smith was in the chamber yesterday for the Health Secretary's uh, statement on this and other health matters. Uh, the change that has been made uh, thus far is a temporary change and it has been made in the interests of patient safety. Uh, the full change, if it was to go ahead, uh, would require to go through all of the, the processes uh, that are normally the case uh, for changes of this nature. And the Health Secretary said yesterday that in this case the final decision will come to her for approval. So, uh, Elaine Smith used the terminology calling in. Uh, the Health Secretary made that clear yesterday and I would hope it is something that the member would welcome. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I learned just last night, First Minister, that Murray & Burrell, a long-established family uh, building firm in Gallus Shields in my constituency, established since 1928, had gone into administration. Today, 35 tradesmen and office staff and two apprentices are redundant. There is also a substantial knock-on effect to at least 15 subcontractors and over 25 suppliers, all local. While I understand that this morning the Scottish Building Federation and CITB, with regard to the apprentices, are already involved, can I ask the government if it has instructed PACE, but can I also advise that the role of the Royal Bank of Scotland in the demise of this local company appears to be central, and that once I have had the full details, I will pursue this matter further? First Minister. Well, I share the member's concern uh, regarding developments in respect of Murray and Borough and the potential impact uh, this may have on employees, uh, the families and on the surrounding area. Um, the Economy Secretary, of course, would be uh, happy to discuss this further with the member and uh, in those discussions include the issue around RBS that she raises. Uh, I can confirm though that our agencies will do whatever uh, can be done to minimise any negative impact. I've instructed already our agency Scottish Enterprise to make contact immediately to see what assistance can be offered and our PACE team is also making contact to offer support for affected employees. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you to ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Uh, the Cabinet will next meet on Tuesday. Patrick Harvey. There is, and has been for a long time, a very strong case for real, fundamental reform of local taxation. As the Cross-Party Commission agreed, the present system of council tax must end. Now, I regret the fact that the SNP no longer supports that view, but we have been willing to work with the government on the modest adjustments that we can support, even if we can't do so without voicing any criticism at all. Tonight's vote on changing the bans is one area where we can agree. So whatever else happens in tonight's vote, the Greens will vote for that measure. And the FM knows that we won't be alone in doing so. Yet the Finance Minister has been warning people today what would happen if this change doesn't pass. And the media are reporting that the SNP may not even back their own policy proposal at the end of the day. Presiding officer, a minority government must sometimes accept modest criticisms. And we've been clear at every step that we're expressing our criticisms without putting these reforms in any danger. Does the First Minister remain committed to her party's proposal to change council tax bans? Will she be voting for it as we will tonight? First Minister made clear in my exchanges with the other leaders uh, my support for the proposition that the Scottish Government has put forward, indeed the proposition that won support in the election. Uh, but we've gone further than that this evening. Uh, the amendment that has been lodged in Derek Mackay's name to the SSI that we will vote on at five o'clock uh, respects the issue of local democracy and it also recognises, as I have recognised previously in this chamber, the desire for further discussions about further reform. And I have made clear, I think I've made it clear to Patrick Harvey in previous exchanges in this chamber that we are open to those further discussions uh, over the course of this parliament about further reform that is progressive uh, and fair and has enshrined that principle of local democracy. So I make that uh, view very clear again today. Uh, effectively, there are two uh, amendments to the SSI uh, on offer for uh, parties this evening. There is the one from Andy Whiteman, which uh, does talk about the principle of, of local democracy. Uh, and there is one from Derek Mackay, which talks about the principle of local democracy 
democracy, uh, but also, crucially, does what Andy Whiteman's amendment doesn't do and talks about the progressive and fair principles as well. That's the one that I hope the Chamber will vote for. I can understand uh, why the Tories would prefer to vote for the former one, but I hope uh, others in the Chamber uh, would see that voting for something that talks about local democracy, fairness and the progressive principle is actually what we should unite behind. And then, yes, unite behind getting £100 million pounds into our schools, which, let's remember, is the key benefit of what we're voting for this evening. Patrick Harvey. The Green Amendment deletes nothing from the government's proposals. It changes nothing in what will happen if the bans are changed and the revenue is raised. It only adds modest criticisms which are widely shared. Now, the First Minister is keen to remind all of us that people will be watching and that people will struggle to understand some consequences if this vote falls. But the only way, the only way in which the SNP's proposal on council tax bans can fall is if the SNP themselves decide to let it fall. I think it would be astonishing. And to paraphrase the First Minister, I think people would struggle to understand if the First Minister and her own colleagues line up with the only other party that supports the discredited council tax and fails to back her own policy. Is wounded pride really worth £100 million? First Minister. Well, I'll take responsibility for how uh, MSPs on uh, these benches vote this evening. The point I'm making is there is a choice of two amendments. Uh, one talks about the principle of local democracy, uh, and that is fair enough. I, you know, that, that is the, the position that Andy Whiteman has put forward. The other accepts that position on local democracy, but also goes on to talk about fairness and progressive taxation. So in terms of the amendments tonight, that's the choice that the Chamber has. I know uh, that the, the words progressive and fair are not in Andy Whiteman's motion, which would make it easier for the Tories uh, to back it. I understand that. But there is an opportunity for there to be a genuine progressive alliance behind the government's amendment tonight that genuinely talks about local democracy and talks about fairness and progressive taxation. And I say again, uh, we are absolutely confident in the proposals we're putting forward, but we're also signalling a willingness to talk to other parties across the chamber uh, to uh, further the discussion about progressive taxation. So I hope we can get to that position tonight and I hope we get to a position where we vote for sensible changes that deliver £100 million for our schools. There's a, there's a number of further supplementaries. If members are as brief and First Minister too, we'll get through them all. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister agree it's an outrage that disabled people who phone a DWP hotline to appeal against benefit sanctions are charged more than millionaires querying tax bills? And will she back calls to end this Tory telephone tax? First Minister. Um, yeah, yes, I think there has been uh, a good case made uh, for that, clearly. Uh, people who are on benefits, particularly those in receipt of disability benefits uh, and indeed those in receipt of, of working tax credits and universal credit are seeing uh, reductions and cuts to their benefit from decisions made by the UK government. And I think it is compounding that injustice uh, that people are, are charged money for having to phone up if they need help or advice. So I think that case has been made. It's clearly uh, an issue for the UK government and I hope they take the right decision. Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the First Minister, in light of recent revelations around Garton Naval General Hospital's operating theatres, is she satisfied with the Scottish Government's handling of her NHS? First Minister. Uh, yes, I am uh, satisfied with that, although, as I said in the Chamber last week, our NHS, although it is performing well, faces challenges, and the job of this Government is to support it in meeting those challenges. In terms of the issue around uh, Gart Naval, we have in place in Scotland a robust inspection system, which uh, is designed to ensure that if there are deficiencies in any aspect of how a hospital is run, its cleanliness in, in particular, uh, then those deficiencies are identified, highlighted and rectified. Uh, that is what will happen in this case, and that's what happens generally with the inspection regime that we have in place. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. Following this morning's very welcome uh, High Court decision that there should be a parliamentary vote on Brexit, will the Scottish Government actively oppose the UK Government's intended appeal when it reaches the UK Supreme Court? First Minister. 
Uh, we will be uh, looking at the judgment very carefully and yes we will actively consider uh, whether or not there is a, a case for the Scottish Government to become participants in that case. Uh, the judgment this morning I, I do not think is a huge surprise to anybody who followed uh, the case but it is hugely significant and it underlines the total chaos and confusion at the heart of the UK Government. I mean we should remember that their refusal to allow a vote in the House of Commons is not some matter of high constitutional principle, it is because they do not have a coherent position and they know that if they take their case to the House of Commons, that will be exposed. The job of this government is to protect Scotland's interests. Scotland voted to remain in the EU, and my job is therefore to protect her place in Europe and in the single market as far as I possibly can. SNP MPs in the House of Commons uh, will certainly not vote for anything that undermines the will or the interests of the Scottish people. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, First Minister, Highlands and Islands Enterprise gave three and a half million pounds to the arms industry in the last decade, two and a half million of that in the last three years, and Scottish Enterprise gave 15 million in the last decade. That's a, a response to a parliamentary question. Would you agree that such expenditure isn't some people's idea of a progressive Scotland? And will you agree to have these enterprise agencies revisit the recipients of this money to provide advice and diversification from destructive activities to endeavours with a more positive benefit for the highlands of islands? of Scotland, Scotland itself and indeed humanity. Yeah. First Minister. Uh, well, I think John Finney and I would agree on uh, much of, of this general issue in terms of uh, ethics in the arms trade and the need for weapons uh, not to be misused as uh, many feel that they are uh, right now in, in Saudi Arabia uh, for attacks on uh, the Yemeni uh, people. But I do think uh, John Finney's uh, particular point here uh, is at risk of, of misrepresenting the position, not deliberately misrepresenting, but misrepresenting the position of our enterprise agencies. The funding Scottish Enterprise has provided uh, supports companies in diversifying and developing non-military applications for technology, as well, of course, as uh, supporting uh, employment opportunities in Scotland. And, and that, of course, is the role of our enterprise agencies, is to support employment, support economic growth uh, and uh, to support economic opportunities. But we will always uh, make sure that that is done in line with our wider uh, principles uh, and values. And that is the case uh, in this particular area, as it is in the case of, of many other areas too. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On Monday, a family came to my constituency surgery. Their father, George Ballantyne, an 83-year-old resident from Christophen, had a fall in March and was taken to Liberton Hospital. After exemplary care and some adaptations to his home, he was declared fit to go home in early June. Yet, uh, on three occasions, he was advised to get ready to go the next morning, but the care package fell through. Last night, George spent his 150th night in Liberton Hospital after being declared fit to go home. Given that the Cabinet Secretary for Health two years ago said that this government was committed to eradicating delayed discharge. Will the First Minister take this opportunity to explain to George and his family why he is still in hospital? Well, the member raises uh, an important issue. The government is, of course, committed to eradicating delayed discharges and we're making progress towards that aim. Uh, the reason we have integrated health and social care services is uh, to try to ensure that uh, individuals do not fall through uh, the gaps in the system as, uh, from what Alex Cole Hamilton has said, appears to be happening in this case. What Alex Cole Hamilton has outlined there uh, certainly sounds to me like an unacceptable situation for uh, an individual. Uh, the health secretary uh, has indicated to me she is aware of this case uh, is looking into and uh, will be writing to Alex Cole Hamilton about it. We want to make sure we have a system in place where people get the right care in the right place at the right time. We're making progress uh, towards that, but it is reforms like integrating health and social care that will allow us to make further progress uh, in the months and years to come. Question number four, Ruth Maguire. To ask the First Minister what analysis the Scottish Government has conducted into the contribution that migrants make to Scotland. First Minister. Uh, well, last week the government published two analytical reports on the contributions that migrants make to Scotland. Uh, we now have robust evidence about the contribution to our economy and our society. We know that the majority of those who come to Scotland are highly qualified young people who are economically active and that European migrants in particular make a positive contribution to the public purse. I welcome these findings as we know that many sectors of our economy are reliant on migrant labour uh, and let me take this opportunity to again say that we truly value the contribution of all migrants uh, to Scotland and welcome all of those who choose to make their lives here. Ruth Maguire. 
thank the First Minister for that response. I welcome these findings, which should help challenge head-on some of the prejudices, prejudices which sadly still prevail about migrants living and working in our society. How will the First Minister work to ensure that Scotland remains a welcoming place for those who wish to live and work here following the UK's vote to leave the EU? First Minister. Well, we've already made it crystal clear on many occasions that the 180,000 or so EU nationals who have chosen to make their home in Scotland uh, continue to be welcome here, and I think that's a sentiment shared right across this chamber. Uh, their contribution to this country is valued, uh, and I do think uh, the position that has been taken not just by this government but across the political spectrum in Scotland uh, start, stands in contrast to the unwelcoming and unpleasant rhetoric about migrants that we increasingly hear from the UK government. Uh, the government continues to explore all options open to us to protect Scotland's interests in Europe. Uh, Mike Russell will chair uh, a focus group later this month to listen to and gather information on the impact uh, that the EU referendum result is having on EU nationals living here and will continue to press the UK government to guarantee without further delay the residency status of fellow EU nationals who have made Scotland their home. Uh, and frankly, I continue to be appalled on a daily basis that this guarantee hasn't yet been given and that we have a UK government that still seems content to use EU nationals as bargaining chips in a wider negotiation. Question number, question number five, Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the University of Strathclyde paper, Brexit and the Scottish financial services sector. First Minister. Well, the University of Strathclyde paper draws attention to the serious impact that Brexit will have on the financial sector in Scotland. It says if the UK does make it much more difficult to bring in skilled people from other countries, it will undermine one of the UK and Scotland's main attractions for internationally mobile businesses and activities. Of course, since that paper was published, there have been further uh, new evidence of the damage a hard Brexit will cause. A leading think tank yesterday warned of a 60% reduction in UK trade and services with EEA countries if a hard Brexit is uh, pursued. Uh, so the Scottish Government will continue to work with the financial services sector and we will continue to consider all possible steps to ensure our continuing relationship with the EU and the single market. Uh, and part of uh, what we will do in that uh, regard refers to the previous question, distance ourselves completely from the damaging anti-immigration rhetoric of the UK Government. Dean Lockhart. I thank the First Minister for that response. The financial services sector in Scotland is indeed vital to the economy, accounting for approximately 10% of our onshore GDP. That's precisely why I'm asking the First Minister to follow the guidance of this report, which concludes that Brexit does not take us to a case for Scottish independence. Not my words, but the conclusion of this report. <laughs> not my words. The argument against independence is also clearly highlighted by another report by Scottish Financial Enterprise which reports that 90% of Scotland's financial trade is with the rest of the UK. Presiding officer, the SNP has issued its consultation paper for a second independence referendum, but it has failed to explain yet again what currency it would propose to use. Would it look to keep the pound? Would it adopt the euro? Would it create a new Scottish pound? This fundamental confusion is creating significantly more uncertainty than to the financial sector than Brexit is. First Minister, if you won't listen to us, will you listen to the guidance of this report and the financial community and scrap your plans for a second independence referendum? Because in the real world, the question of independence does not transcend everything else. First Minister. Well, I, think, I think for a Tory to lead with a chin on currency uh, right now is almost as inept as Ruth Davidson standing up and talking about constitutional uncertainty on the day her own government gets overturned in the courts on the issue of the triggering of Article 50. Uh, my objective is clear, and it's objective, I, I hope, that whatever our disagreements on the Constitution, all people in this chamber could get behind. I want to keep the Scotland's, uh, Scotland's economy, including our financial services sector, in the single market. That's what I am seeking to try to find a way of doing. And for the life of me, I can't understand why the Conservatives, uh, who before the referendum expressed support for the single market, find it so hard uh, to support us in doing now. So we will continue to act in the best interests of Scotland and in the best interests of the Scottish economy. Because be in no doubt, the alternative to that is for Scotland, including our financial services sector, to be taken off the hard Brexit cliff edge uh, by the UK government. That would be disastrous for our economy generally and for 
financial services in particular. You know, Boris Johnson last night eventually said something that I could almost agree with uh, when he says that Brexit is likely to be a titanic success. Uh, probably that's the truest thing he said in a long time. Yeah. Question number six, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the new living wage rate. First Minister. I welcome the new living wage rate, which uh, I announced on Monday, £8.45 an hour, which will benefit thousands of Scottish workers, helping ensure that people's basic wage meets the real cost of living. Uh, over 630 employers in Scotland are now accredited living wage employers, uh, and we have the highest proportion of employees paid the living wage or more across all of the countries of the UK. Uh, I encourage all employers to recognise the benefits of paying the real living wage and consider signing up as accredited employers, because while uh, there is much progress. We still have work to do and we are determined that we will do it. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the First Minister for her response? And I very much welcome the increase in the real living wage in Scotland and indeed across the UK. But although there's been significant progress in the public sector, one in five workers, principally in the private sector, are earning less than the living wage. So I share her ambition that we must do more. One of the levers the First Minister has is the Scottish Business Pledge. But take-up of that pledge is low. It's disappointing that only 0.2% of Scotland's firms are taking part. And the take-up is worst in accommodation and food services, where pay is often lower than other sectors. So can I ask the First Minister what action she will take to improve the take-up of the business pledge, particularly in those low-paid sectors, and increase the living wage for more workers across Scotland? First Minister. Well, there are significant uh, companies, uh, both in, in number and in uh, type of company, already signed up to the business pledge, but we continue to encourage more companies across Scotland to do so. And again, whatever our disagreements in this chamber, I hope that all uh, MSPs across the chamber would join us in encouraging companies to do the right thing, uh, to sign up to the business pledge and the progressive uh, business practices that are encapsulated in that pledge. The most significant lever uh, we use, of course, in terms of specifically the living wage is the living wage accreditation campaign. We now have more than 600 employers signed up to that. Of course, there will be many employers across the country who pay the living wage but aren't yet accredited, and I would encourage them to get accredited. We've set a target of having 1,000 employers signed up to the accreditation campaign by this time next year. And again, all MSPs can help us in trying to make sure that we reach that target. And I want to take the opportunity today to thank the Poverty Alliance for the great work they do in leading uh, the accreditation campaign for us. So we have made progress here uh, in the public sector, but also in the private sector. But 20% of people across the country uh, still are not paid the living wage, which is why all of us have to work hard to encourage companies to do the right thing. And I, I will end on this point, which I think is the crucial point for any business listening to this and perhaps understandably worrying about whether they can afford to pay the living wage. The living wage is not only good for workers. All of the evidence says that paying the living wage helps companies as well. It helps increase their productivity, reduce their absenteeism eh, and improve their bottom line. So it's a win-win situation and we should all get behind the campaign to make sure everybody gets paid it. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Would the First Minister agree with me that the way to ensure true financial security and lift people out of poverty is to have a strong and stable economy? which provides good, secure and reliable jobs. And that such an economy is undermined both by making Scotland the highest tax part of the UK and by the ongoing threat of another separation referendum. First Minister. Briefly, briefly, First Minister. These Tories obsessed with independence, for goodness sake. Um, yes, I do agree about the importance of a strong and stable economy, which is why I so deprecate the Brexit vandalism of the Tory United Kingdom government. I also think it's really important, as we have just been doing in a, a sensible discussion about the living wage, that we focus on the financial security of individuals and of families across this country. Uh, the Scottish Government is focused on doing that principally through our support for the living wage. Uh, but one of the things running counter to all of our efforts, of course, are the policies of the UK Government, which are about working tax credits being cut, benefits being cut, support through universal credit uh, and the work allowance being cut. So before uh, the Tory members come here uh, and lecture 
Speaker, this government, perhaps they should pick up the phone to their own colleagues in London and tell them get to get behind the efforts to improve economic stability and the living standards of families across this country. Question number seven, Mike Rumbles. To ask the First Minister further to ScotRail being fined £483,000 for failing to meet performance standards, when services will improve? First Minister. Well, the ScotRail franchise contains the toughest quality regime within the UK to drive up passenger standards. Uh, our service quality regime checks more than 30 customer facilities and services across trains and stations in Scotland every four weeks. Inspectors patrol the network daily, uh, pushing up ScotRail's quality, meaning our passenger satisfaction figures sit some 7% ahead of uh, the British average. But the recent fine shows that further improvements need to be made in terms of service delivery, and Transport Scotland have requested remedial action plans from ScotRail to focus on improving performance in the necessary areas. I grumbles. Now, MSPs have seen this flimsy document entitled the Scott Rail Improvement Plan with more pictures in it than detail. How can the First Minister expect the public to know what Scott, R Scott Rail's improvement plans actually are if the whole plan and it needs to be published? It hasn't been published. Ministers are hiding behind commercial confidentiality and that's simply not good enough. The Transport Minister needs to publish the full plan with any really commercially sensitive information redacted. First Minister, we need some openness and transparency here. First Minister. Well, it strikes me that the member can't have it both ways. He can't come and ask a question about hefty fines uh, for Scott Rail not meeting its performance uh, and then say that the Scottish Government is not taking this issue seriously. There's no hiding behind any commercial confidentiality. The performance uh, requirements for Scott Rail are contained in the franchise. They're not meeting at this stage uh, the uh, requirement to have 91 out of 100 trains arriving at destinations within the industry recognised uh, punctuality measures. Uh, they are uh, sitting at around 89 trains per 100. That is why uh, the Transport Minister has insisted on an improvement plan and while we continue to monitor uh, their performance against that plan on a, a weekly basis we will continue to do that because the travelling public uh, deserve to know uh, that their trains uh, will run uh, effectively efficiently and on time and we are determined to work through the contract to make sure that is the case and of course ultimately if ScotRail uh, do not uh, meet their performance requirements we have the option of terminating the contract early and that's very much an option that we keep on the table. That concludes the First Minister's questions. We now move to there's a point of order from Clare Hockey. Alex Cole Hamilton raised a point of order where he stated, and I quote, we have had five sycophantic questions from members of the government party. This related to questions following a statement by the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport. Rule 7.3 of Standing Orders of the Scottish Parliament states members shall at all times conduct themselves in a courteous and respectful manner. Not only was he wrong, three questions, not five, came from the SNP backbenches, but I believe Alec Cole Hamilton fell short of the standards I referred to by using this language in relation to fellow members of this Parliament. Thank you. Can I thank the member for point of order? Uh, I think the presenting officer in the chair dealt with the point of order at the time, uh, but I would take this opportunity to urge all members to treat each other with respect. Thank you. We'll move to members' business now. If ministers can change chairs.